Hey, if you're guests with us this morning, let me introduce myself. My name's Matt. It's my privilege to serve here at Central as lead pastor. We're in a series looking at the life of the prophet Daniel, and we're going to look at just a snippet of Daniel this morning, but our main text will be from somewhere else in the book of Jeremiah. So if you want to go ahead and find the book of Jeremiah this morning, that would be Wonderful, but we're going to start somewhere else. We're going to start with this question. How are we as believers called to treat people? What, 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 what is the driving motivation in the way we treat people? Well, Jesus actually tells us what the driving motivation, the mission of our life, if we're followers of Jesus, is the Great Commission. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, and this is so important, and every word here is intentional. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end. Of the age. Everything else in your life and in my life as a follower of Jesus is subservient to this. If you are a follower of Christ Jesus, this is what your life is about. Not what your life should be about, this is what your life is about. Because if you are following Jesus, which is different than knowing Jesus, but if you're following Jesus, you are living out. His great commission on your life. If not, then you may be an admirer of Jesus. You may know Jesus. You may know about Jesus. But following actually requires us to obey the commands of God on our life, to go into the world and share the good news with people who desperately need it. In 1834... An appeal was made by British churches for doctors and other medical, medical missionaries to go to the country of China. A young man set himself to this task, studying to become a doctor. His name was David Livingstone. He determined that he was going to go to China, so he studied Greek, he studied theology, he studied medicine. But in 1838... Um, he was accepted by the London Missionary Society for this assignment. But the following year, a war broke out between Great Britain and China, crushing Livingstone's dreams of going and serving there. So here was a man, felt called by God, prepared himself to go, but then the opportunity to go did not present itself. He was ready and willing, but the door was shut. Livingstone Providentially, short after, shortly after this, met a Scottish missionary named Robert Moffat, who would eventually become his father-in-law. And it was Moffat who first challenged Livingstone to the continent of Africa. What started it all were the words of his father-in-law. I love these words. He said, Many a morning have I stood on the porch of my house and looking northward, have seen the smoke arise from villages that have never heard of Jesus Christ. I have seen at different times the smoke of a thousand villages, villages whose people are without Christ, without God, without hope in the world. And then his words trailing off, he said, the smoke of a thousand villages, the smoke of a thousand villages. So on November 20th, 1840, David Livingstone was ordained as a missionary and he set sail for South Africa at the end of the year and he arrived in Cape Town on March 14th, 1841. Livingstone would work for years setting up mission outposts, blazing new trails across the continent. And even today, David Livingstone is known by more people as a British explorer than he is as a gospel missionary, although everywhere he went, he took the gospel of King Jesus with him. He worked for years on the continent. Those years took their toll. If you know anything of his life, they took their toll on David Livingstone. But he carried on, determined to fight slavery on the continent and track down the elusive Nile River and where it began. Livingstone believed that if a route could be made into the interior of Africa, that it would help them fight the slave trade there and that it would open up pathways for the gospel to make its way into the heart of Africa. At the age of 60, David Livingstone died in what is now Zambia. 
on May 1st, 1873 at four in the morning where he was found dead kneeling beside his cot in the middle of the interior of Africa. His African friends, former slaves that he had helped to free, buried his heart under a tree because it was said that his heart was in Africa. They read the funeral service from the Book of Common Prayer and then sat down and cried a great deal. They wrapped his body in calico and dried it in the sun to preserve it for the long trip back home. They trekked 1,500 miles to the coast, a journey of more than eight months. David Livingstone's body is now buried in Westminster Abbey. A local pastor in Malawi had this to say about, this is, this is recent, this was this year he said this. A local pastor in Malawi had this to say about David Livingstone's life and legacy. He said, above all, Livingstone's life is a great demonstration of Jesus' parable of the mustard seed in Mark 4, 30 to 32. Surely he didn't know how much the seed sown in southern and central Africa would grow. I doubt he ever envisioned his labors would influ influence the entire nation of Malawi. In one journal entry, Livingston wrote, I will place no value on anything I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of God. By God's grace, the kingdom is no longer a tiny mustard seed in Africa. It has grown and put out large branches all across the continent. Praise God for his faithful servant. Someone once asked Livingstone about his motivation, and he replied, I was compelled by the love of Jesus. A medical doctor, a missionary, a preacher, an African explorer, a humanitarian, and a fighter against the slave trade, David Livingstone went fearlessly to places other outsiders had never gone, and from the obscurity of the remote African interior became one of the most celebrated heroes of his era. The call on our lives is similar. Because the smoke still rises from a thousand villages where people have not heard the good news about Jesus. 42% of all of the people groups in the world today, 42%, nearly half of all the people groups in the world in 2023 are still considered unreached with the gospel. Can you imagine? You can't, because I can't either. I cannot imagine what life would be like not knowing the good news about Jesus. I just can't. I cannot fathom that. And we are called to go to the unreached people groups. But we are also called to go to the unreached family members, friends, co-workers, and acquaintances employees and customers as well, our students and our teachers. We are called to those who have not yet received the gospel. In our days, for every single person in this room, we can see a revival in our church. We can, in our days, see gospel restoration in our community. I believe that to the core of my being. We can see those things. But all of that must be motivated by the resurrection of King Jesus and fulfilled by his commission upon our lives. So with the love of Christ as our motivation, with the Great Commission as our mandate, with the Holy Spirit as our power and guide, and with the life of Daniel as an example to us, we ask this question, how do we treat people? How are we called to interact with people? We're going to look at two parts of that. This morning, we're going to look at how do we treat people who are not of the faith. And then next week, God willing, we'll dive into how do we interact with and treat people who are of the faith. The first is this. This is how Daniel interacted with people. In just one phrase, we are called to influence our enemies. That is the point of today. We are called to influence our enemies. And when I say enemies here, here's what I mean. An enemy is anyone who resists and antagonizes you because you are living out the Great Commission. That's what we mean by enemy this morning. Anyone, in other words, anyone who is resistant to the gospel. So when I say enemy, I'm not talking about somebody that you are ready to get in a cage match with and go nine rounds. We're not talking about somebody who is your mortal enemy. We're talking about somebody who's antagonistic or resistant to the gospel 
of Jesus. While Daniel was prophesying and ministering to the Jews in the Babylonian capital, there were two other prophets who lived during his lifetime who were doing other ministry as well. If this was a Bible quiz, I would ask you who those are. It's not, so I'm just going to tell you. One of those was Jeremiah. Jeremiah ministered at the same time Daniel did. Now, while Daniel was called to go to Babylon and minister there, Jeremiah was called to remain behind in Judah and minister there. The third prophet was the oddball out of the group, and his name was Ezekiel. He's the strangest man in all of the scriptures, I believe. And I love the book of Ezekiel because of that. Ezekiel prophesied outside of the capital while, of course, Daniel became the lead Hebrew politician in Babylon. Jeremiah writes a letter. Chapter 29 is where we're going to look at. Jeremiah writes a letter. This is the context here matters so much. Jeremiah is called by God to write a letter from Judah to the captives in Babylon. Daniel is one of the captives in Babylon. Daniel and the three boys that we come to know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego They are captives in Babylon. Jeremiah, prophet in Judah, writes his letter to those who are in Babylon. Daniel receives it. Maybe not personally, but Daniel is aware of it. Daniel has read it. Here are the words of Jeremiah to the captives in Babylon from the Lord. Jeremiah 29. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles. Circle that word, exiles. We're going to come back to that next week. And to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar has taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, here's the important part, the le- Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what God says to the exiles who are now in Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare you will find your welfare. Jeremiah's prophecy was God's letter to Daniel. It was God's letter to the other exiles and and captives there. So in reading Jeremiah 29, we are reading Daniel's Bible. This is what he had. And we know from later on in in the book of Daniel, Daniel read this and studied it and, and knew it. And Daniel read that God's desire for the Hebrews in Babylon is that they would settle down, influence their culture, and cultivate what was around them. And God's desire is that you and I would influence the culture that is around us. So God has uniquely placed every single one of us in this room, in the position that he has placed us in for a reason. Whether you're in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, in the workforce, in the home, whether you own a business, whether you're a teacher, whether you work in the healthcare profession, you are not there by accident. You are there because God wants you to cultivate in the community that he has placed you in. In other words, he's called you to be an influence where you are. The person sitting next to you is not called to be an influence where God has placed you. God did not call your church staff to be an influence in the place he sent you. He sent you. So we are called, each and every one of us, in the sphere of influence the Lord has given us to be an influence for his good and his glory in these days. And we see that in Daniel's life as much as we see it in the lives of believers in the New Testament. Daniel served four different kings in Babylon. He served Nebuchadnezzar, followed by Belshazzar, Darius, and then finally he served King Cyrus. During his 70-year captivity, 
<coughs> excuse me, in Babylon, Daniel shared his faith with each of these four kings. So Daniel is an example of a man who gained influence and pointed people to his God. So if we sum up what God is calling us to and what God was calling the exiles in Babylon to, culturally speaking, it is two things. The first is just cultivate, cultivate, build it up, make it better. Remember, this is not your home, but this is where you live. So take care of where you live. What does that look like today? What does what God was calling Jeremiah to do, the message that he called him to share with the exiles in Babylon, what does that look like in Douglasville, Villarica, Winston, or wherever it is you live today? What does it look like to cultivate the culture that you live in? Does it look like opening up a good coffee shop? I hope so. But does it? It does. It, it, it does. D- d- does it look like volunteering in, in a civic organization, even if it is not explicitly Christian? It, it, it does. It, does it look like giving your time and your energy to those around you and, and coaching a little league team, leading a Boy Scout troop? It does. Does it look like just being involved in the community that the Lord has given you to shepherd and cultivate? It does. One of the most spiritual things that you and I can do, watch me, is to simply be available. It's just to be available as a church, as individuals. That's why... Our Saturday morning upward ministry exists. That's why in this room we host baccalaureate services. That's why we have fed teachers and continue to do so because we want to be a source of blessing to our community. This is what God is calling us to. How do we treat people who who are antagonistic to the faith? How do we treat people who are resistant to the gospel? We cultivate. And by cultivating in our community, I believe opportunity is born. We want to be a source of blessing to our community. Part of that is this phrase, and I'd like for us all to learn it. Connection before correction. Connection before correction. As individuals, can I encourage us all to learn this? Connection needs to come before correction. Let me explain it to you like this. If one of your children were out of line and a stranger goes to them to correct them, that's going to hit a little bit different than if mom or dad does, right? If somebody comes up and tells my kid to do something, and my kid doesn't know who they are, my kid doesn't necessarily have to do it. That person's not an authority in their life. But if I say it, it better happen. It doesn't always, but it better happen. I mean business. Sometimes. Connection has to come before correction. In other words, we we have to earn the right to share the correcting message of the gospel. I, I, I mean, there is nothing wrong, and there are opportunities the Lord gives you just to drop little gospel seeds everywhere. We should do that because we never know when those are going to take root and somebody else is going to come along and water those. I'm not telling you not to share the gospel when all you have is a moment. But what I am saying to us is it is far better to build a relationship with someone so that you can slowly drip, drip, drip the goodness of Jesus all over their lives. Connection comes before correction. Daniel, who had the moral high ground. We talked about this the other week. There's not one negative word said about Daniel in in all of Scripture. He has the moral high ground. Not once do you find him arguing, explaining, criticizing, or condemning evil Babylonian leaders. Even though he had the moral high ground, he had the right, watch me, he had the right to do so. But Daniel knew that the way he represented God mattered as much as the fact that he represented God. We are motivated by the love of Christ to obey the great commission. Then we are going to build relationships with people that desperately need the gospel with the goal of sharing the gospel. 
So we cultivate. We cultivate, and that means connecting before correcting. The second thing we do is we bless. We cultivate, and then we bless. Jeremiah tells the exiles <coughs> to seek the welfare of the city. Seek the welfare of the city. What does it look like to be a blessing in our community? Number one, just a couple of things. I'm going to give you three right here. Honor always. Daniel always treated those around him with respect. And to be clear, he had plenty of reasons to be angry and to treat people with no respect. Do you think he had reasons to be angry? Daniel was kidnapped. Taken away from his friends and his family, the only home that he'd ever known. And then after they kidnapped him, they tried to burn his best friends alive in a furnace. And yet Daniel, for some reason, always treated those around him with respect. That's confusing in our day and age. You treat people with honor and respect in this day and age when they're antagonistic towards you? You will confuse them. They don't know how to receive it. Does it take more conviction and courage to lash out or to see through the rod of the culture and to look on people with compassion? Daniel, always honored. Second, speak the truth. After we honor, we speak the truth. Trust the Lord with the results, but speak the truth. When Daniel was presented with opportunities to speak, he always did so truthfully. He didn't back down. He didn't cower in fear because he was afraid he was going to say something upsetting. He spoke truth, always honoring, always treating people with dignity, but he spoke truth, always telling the truth. Well, we tell the truth, but in grace, and we trust the Lord with the results. So honor always, speak the truth, and then here's the third thing. And this is the one that hits a little hard for me. Thou shalt not gripe. Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be, this is so important, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. We're far less likely to have an eternal impact by posting or reposting a Facebook slide than we are by investing our time and our lives into building relationships where we can actually connect with people first. Griping has never won one soul to Jesus. No one has ever been complained into the kingdom of God. Not once. Why? Because it goes against God's plan for your life. When I was 21, 22 years of age, I had the opportunity to go and serve in my first church. Um, and it just so happened, I just ripped my microphone off. It just so happened that this was in the British Isles. And there was a man there, um, you can ask me later one-on-one what his name was, but there was a man there in the church who was, at the time, a, a, multi, a billionaire many times over. Billionaire, with a B. Probably the only billionaire that I've ever met. And this man was paying my salary. It was a smaller church. And this man was, I mean, just influential. Like, I mean, friends with members of the royal family, I mean, he makes a phone call and things, things happen. On golf courses all over the world, gold mines, businesses everywhere. Um, and it, it was, I had been there for several weeks and I had not met him because he was always out of town on business, buying companies or doing whatever he did, I don't know. I was so nervous to meet him because I'd never, I'd never sat down with a billionaire before, somebody that was as learned as he was, as educated as he was, with as much experience as he had, who had done all of the great things. Before I left for the Isle of Man, <clears throat> I'm sitting with my brother, who actually knew this man, and we're at my, my grandmother's house. We're in Alabama, and she had a Billy Graham coffee table book. And Brent and I are actually talking about where I'm going and who I'm meeting and talking about this man. And as he's flipping through the book, just casually, he says, oh, there he is. There's a guy who was 
close friends with Dr. Billy Graham, and they're like walking across ruins in, in Ireland. I mean, this guy was just a mover and a shaker, still is. And I was so nervous about meeting him, and I, I, I thought, I, I, I just don't want to say something wrong. I don't want to mess up. I, you know, what if he's, you know, what if he's all stuffy and I don't, I don't know how to say the right thing and he's already British and I'm, I, I, I just, I just didn't, I didn't feel good enough if I'm honest with you. And after I'd been there a couple of weeks, I got to know two young men that were in my student ministry there who were his boys. And I had the opportunity to pastor his kids for a year in our student ministry. And as I got to know his boys, something strange happened. I began to be less nervous about meeting their father. Because the more I knew the boys, the more I felt like I'm, I knew something of the dad. And if the kids were like this, then I felt like I, I, I sort of knew the dad a little bit already. Paul says, I want you to, uh, in fact, if you're not there, flip over. Go to Philippians chapter 2. you got to see this for yourself. This is, I, I think this is potentially life-changing for some of us in the room. This may be the most important thing that we read today, and I didn't, I didn't think it would be. But Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Through 16. If you're there, just say I'm there. I'm going to assume that's most of us. Look at it again with me. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. That's the command. So come on, don't, don't complain and gripe about things. Don't, don't dispute with us. Don't, don't, don't get caught up in the, in the riffraff. Don't, don't get, look, if, if we modernize this, don't get caught up in stupid Facebook arguments. That's what Paul's saying here. Okay? Why? But here's the key, that you may be blameless and innocent. Why? Blameless and innocent. What's the next phrase? Because you are what? You're God's kids. Why do we not gripe? Because you are God's children, and people will know something of the Father when they know his kids. And if I were to confess something to you this morning, it would be that I have not always been a good representation of my heavenly Father. But the opportunity before us is this. Be a represent. Let people know something of your heavenly Father because they know you. You are children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights. So Paul says the reason we don't gripe and complain as we're engaging with the culture is because we are children of God. We represent who the Father is. You sh In other words, you are so far above all of the stuff that is down here that we get dragged down into the mud on. But no, we live up here. We're above all that. Why? Because our, our, our citizenship is in heaven. We're walking around, crawling around in the mud with the world when our citizenship is up here. And we're supposed to show them what he is like. And we can't show them what he is like when we're living way down here in the mud with them. You understand? You with me? Thou shalt not gripe. We don't represent our father well when we do. Number three, watch. Watch. What do we watch for? Watch for open doors. Be ready when God opens the door because doors are opening. I had one open for me this week. I'll tell you about it later. Daniel chapter 2 is when the door begins to open for Daniel. The king who has taken Daniel captive has a terrible dream. You know the story, most of you. He is so troubled by it, can't make sense of it. No one else can either. Daniel has been about the business of cultivating and blessing. He, he's been connecting. He's been honoring everyone that he comes in contact with. And then crisis hits. And oftentimes, it is crisis that presents the opportunity for the people of God to shine like lights in the world. All of the king's men, all the astrologers, the cultists, the pundits, the professional religious people, the TV preachers in, in Daniel's day, the charlatans, the crooks, and the liars could not answer the challenge of the king. And they said, Daniel chapter 2, verse 11, the thing that the king asked it, it, is difficult. And no one can show it to the king except the gods. And they were right. Partially. 
whose dwelling is not with the flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Guess who's in that boat? Daniel and his friends. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. And they're wondering, why are you killing us? We didn't do anything. You guys stole us from our own country, brought us here, tried to cook us in a furnace, and now you want to kill us because somebody can't interpret your dream? This is not really working out well for Daniel and his friends. Verse 14, then the door opens. The door opens. He sees the open door. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. Well, this is why you're going to be killed, which is always nice to know why you're going to be executed. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he may show the interpretation to the king. Daniel doesn't have an interpretation yet. He didn't have anything yet. You know what that's called? Massive confidence in the Lord. So you know what that's called? It's called an open door. When the world is going to hell in a handbasket, the wise people are doing what Daniel did. They are prayerfully contending for truth. Why? Because they realize what the Bible says is true. He who wins souls is wise. We watch for the door to open. We prayerfully contend for the truth. We stay humble, honoring those around us. And we watch for that door just to crack open a little bit. As Southern Baptists, we invest an enormous amount of money and manpower on disaster relief. Why is that? Open door. When a hurricane or a forest fire like the ones that some of us in this room have been through happen, we're vulnerable and needy. We recognize we're not in control when disaster hits. And that's exactly what happens in Daniel. The king and all of his men are are, are vulnerable. It's beyond their control. They even confessed it. We can't do this. It's out of our hands. But the wise young man, Daniel, sees this as an open door. Step four is this. Step through it. When you see the door open, you step through it. Seeing an open door is good. Walking through an open door is better. Watch this. Verse 27. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, no enchanters, no magicians, no astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. You're right so far, king. None of them can do it. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dreams and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these, and he lays it out. When you are walking faithfully with the Lord, sincerely pursuing him, motivated by his love. And what I mean by that is this. When you motivated by his love, when you are thinking about and dwelling on the love of Jesus, you are actually spending time contemplating on a daily basis the goodness of Jesus. That will move you to take the Great Commission seriously. Why? Because when you're thinking on the love of Jesus and you're remembering the love of Jesus, for you, all of a sudden, a great compassion is born in your gut that will move you to do something about them. It's the love of Jesus that motivates us. And then opportunities will begin to make themselves obvious. They're there all the time. But when you're dwelling on the love of Christ, then all of a sudden you start to see them. Because you see people not as obstacles, but you start to see them as opportunities. Why? I'm dwelling on the love of Jesus. I'm looking for an opportunity to share a good word about Jesus, to encourage someone in Jesus' name, to share the message and the truth of the gospel of Jesus. Daniel is a great example for us to engage our culture. We need to influence those who resist God. That's what we're called to. But there is a much better example than Daniel to follow. Jesus put it like this. Remember, we're we're talking about loving those who are resistant to God. That's our definition for an enemy here. You probably know where we're headed. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' inaugural address. He says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
That fits Daniel to a T. It fits us, some of us. Man, do we have, do we have people in our lives that are resistant to the gospel of King Jesus? Yeah. Some of us feel, have, have dealt with probably just minor persecution, but they, they've hated on you because you love Jesus. But I say to you, pray for those people so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. It all comes back to that relational bit. We're showing them who the Father is. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? He says, everybody does that. Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect or complete in your love as your heavenly, what? Your father. So we're showing them. They know the kids, they know the dad. And you have heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. And today you have heard it said, win the argument. Doesn't matter how you treat people. And today you've heard it said, have the last word. And today you've heard it said, be wittier than they are so that you can win in a war with words with them. Today you have heard it said, don't back down. Today you have heard it said, love those who vote like you. Today you have heard it said, love those who have the same values as you. Today you have heard it said, and we justify it many times by standing against the corrupting influence of our culture and world, and we must stand against that as salt and light in the world that we are put into. But aren't you glad this morning that while you were yet a sinner, Jesus Christ said, I will love them enough to die for them. What an example we have to follow. Who this morning, and here's how we end. Here it is. It's so simple. Who this morning, who this morning in your life is an enemy? Who is an enemy in your life? And not, you can't say the IRS has to be a real person. They have to have a face and a name. Who's the enemy? Guess what? That's who you're called to love. That's who you're called to love. Heads bowed, eyes closed. This morning as our time together is coming to a close. I want to encourage every one of us in the room right now to stay in this moment where I do believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to some of us. If there's a name that just came in your mind, if there's a name, can I encourage you to do something? Well, everybody else has their heads bowed and their eyes closed. You can open yours. You can take out a pen and you write down their initials. Even now, like if the, 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 I mean, the godliest thing you can do this morning is take seriously what the Holy Spirit is speaking in your life right now. There's people in your life that you're called to influence with the gospel, but some of us have treated them, you know, we, we've held them at arm's distance from our lives. We've not cultivated, we've not honored the way that we're called to. Who this morning do you need to demonstrate the love of Christ to specifically? Write it down. Is your life as busy like my life? Monday morning rolls around. I guarantee you many of us in here will forget what God said to us in this moment. And you have wasted your time we don't put into action what the Spirit of God is compelling us to do. There's others of us in the room this morning that we have not encountered the love of Jesus. We haven't been changed. We we, we are still, we're we're pre-Jesus. Can I just say to you this morning, there is no excuse good enough to walk away today without a relationship with Jesus. There are excuses, I'll give you that. But there's not one good enough not to be in right relationship with Jesus this morning. He is not holding you at arm's distance. You are holding him at arm's distance. 
And so this morning, drop your guard and embrace the love of Jesus. In a moment, I'm going to say amen. And if the Lord has put somebody on your heart that you feel led to pray for this morning, that is what this time is for. You come and you pray for them. Let us plead on behalf of people who don't yet know Jesus for open doors that we can walk through to show the love of Jesus and the message of Jesus to them. And if you're one of those people this morning say, I just need the love of Jesus this morning, then would you come forward? Just come see one of our pastors. They will they'll meet you up the aisle when they see you coming. I want to pray with you. If it's obedience in another area, baptism, to join this church, uh, 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 to rededicate your life to Jesus, to take seriously what he's putting on your heart, then this is the time to get right with him. Heavenly Father, we love you. Spirit of God, we thank you for moving in our midst this morning, for convicting us, for encouraging us. And we thank you, Son of God, this morning that while we were yet sinners, Christ, you died for us. May we live like sons and daughters. In your good and beautiful name, the name of King Jesus, we pray. Amen. You stand, do business with God.